Oh, the podium. Okay. Yeah, let's do, let's do the podium. Yeah. 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 students in politics, so very, very um, out of place in my department, I don't know you, but uh, I'm a co-organizer for the workshop Energy on the Left. Um, Bob is giving me a keynote for the, the workshop. Um, this is the third year of Energy on the Left, and it's a small workshop. Um, it's kind of, uh, was one of a kind until this year when Yale started putting on Energy in the Humanities, um, which is a huge conference now. Um, a couple of days ago, so now we have big competition. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited about the people who have come in from near and far to be part of this workshop. Um, we're gonna be working off, workshopping our papers tomorrow, and so I'm glad that you're here. And uh, the workshop is, uh, is sponsored by the History Department at NYU, the Department of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, Kavorkian, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So thank you for being here. This is Alex Bajukas. Hi, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and to the Haga Kavorkian Center for Near East Studies for hosting this event. Um, this is a Title VI center, so we have a lot of public events, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, but uh, please feel free to come. Um, I'm a PhD student here, and uh, first I wanted to thank Lola and Zach for their work organizing the conference, and Sarah for her work doing whatever it is, and all, all the other logistical stuff. Um, and I'm here to uh, introduce our speaker today. Um, so it's an honor to introduce Professor Robert Vitalis. Um, his work has had, has had a significant impact on my own, and I suspect that's true for a number of you in this room as well. Um, Professor Vitalis has something of a signature style in his work. Uh, they often begin with kind of a familiar, generally accepted narrative about something that we all ostensibly know. Uh, he then proceeds to thoroughly demolish that narrative um, and shows them the process where it came from, why and how it was propagated, uh, and whose interest it serves. Uh, finally, he then puts forward his own revision, which is invariably based on meticulous research and is far more attuned to issues of race, empire, and capital. In the fields of area studies and international relations, which seem to suffer from an unusually large number of toxic mythologies, this work has been very invaluable and generative. Um, so his first work on uh, When Capitalists Collide looks at narratives of the creation of Egyptian capitalism um, and shows how, in fact, Egyptian business groups were not particularly nationalistic or necessarily even Egyptian. His second, America's Kingdom, debunks the story that Aramco developed or modernized in kind of backward Saudi Arabia. Instead, he traces how the oil company exploited U.S. practices of Jim Crow segregation and autocratic corporate governance to Saudi Arabia, where desegregation was forced on the company by its outraged Saudi workers. Uh, his third book, White World Power, Black Power, Power Politics, White World Order, Black Power Politics, excuse me. Uh, traces the startlingly white supremacist roots of the field of international relations and dispels the amnesia that sidelines the foundational contributions of a number of scholars of color. Uh, tonight, he's taking aim at the myths of oil that underpin so much of knowledge production on geopolitics, the economy, and seemingly everything else. So it's great to have him here at the Corporation <coughs> Center, and without further ado, here is Professor Van Hals. Thank you. Kind of captured what I'm going to do. So I'm going to sit. Is that okay? Um, sure. Uh, we'll just try to be informal. It's a, a pleasure to be here tonight uh, to lead off this fantastic workshop on energy in the left. I want to thank Zach. You don't see Zach because though he's a co organizer, he's sitting in Paris <laughs> at, the, uh, at the present time, uh, and Lola uh, for their hard work in putting it together. It's not an easy thing to do to organize one of these things. So I intend to talk as a challenge and a provocation in both their honors, okay? So in, a, in my, and it's actually the first talk I'm, I'm giving based on a book I've just finished writing, and I finished it about four weeks ago. So in, in my forthcoming book, I uh, take apart 
an ideological construction that I call oil craft. I mean by that a set of deeply held pervasive beliefs about the world, together with the actions these seeming vivid truths license. What kinds of actions? There are op-ed, op-eds and classified memoranda, documentaries, dissertations, classroom lectures, naval patrols and calls at port, journal articles, podcasts, press conferences, and protests, to name a few. Oil craft is the close kin, not of statecraft, you might think of it that way, or the art of diplomacy, but I'm using it in a different way. I mean it's like witchcraft. (laughs) A kind of magical thinking on the part of many, diplomats included, about a commodity that, in fact, is bought and sold on the New York Mercantile Exchange and elsewhere, the same as copper, coal, rubber, palm oil, tin, and so on, all of which were once imagined as vital and strategic too. And in fact, it's only in the 1970s that all those other so-called vital and strategic commodities have been forgotten, and then a new narrative starts to emerge about one commodity that's vital. So oil craft is about the reasoning that makes notions of um, oil as power, let's say, and oil as exceptional, views that I suspect some of you hold about the reasoning that makes it seem unquestionably true, taken for granted, while making my own claim suspect, jarring, or risible. You see, the many widespread popular beliefs about oil and the so-called need to control and now secure access or stabilize prices or prevent hostile powers from holding the world economy hostage have no basis in fact. Sure, we find US officials, past and present, proclaiming about these matters. Journalists believe them. Books get written. The left believes it, or important voices in the left believe it to be the key to US hegemony or primacy. Real action, in other words, creates evidence for the imagined thing. And like witchcraft, constantly dumps factitious evidence for itself into the real world. Now, if you're unhappy with the witchcraft analogy, then think instead in terms of doctrinal verities. That's a phrase I'm borrowing from uh, Noam Chomsky, who insists that it is the United States need to control Iraqi oil resources that drove the war in 2003. Unfortunately, this belief, among others that are at the core of most understandings of world of oil and world politics today, aren't as plausible or as credible as the racist ideas that once animated anthropology, sociology, political science, history, and so forth. In fact, they share some origin points in common with scientific racism. In the hands of the professors, politicians, and public intellectuals, oil craft is an equivalently pseudoscientific discourse that nonetheless many believe unquestionably true, much as they once believed that black people would die out in the South. Oh, sorry, would die out in the North. It was an argument that was made in international relations journals at the turn of the 20th century. African Americans could not live in the North because they were a tropical people, and they would die out unless constantly uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 increased by migration. So they might die out in the uh, north, or that mulattoes could not produce fertile offspring, another key theory of, uh, uh, of social science at the time. As with the folk beliefs disguised as biological science and racism, oil craft depends on a kind of folk geology. The misapprehension of the stock of the so-called strategic resource has fixed. You know how folks argued in the 1920s? the 1940s, the 1970s, and again in the early 2000s, that the world was rapidly running out of this scarce and vital resource and that the US and its rivals would struggle over what was left. This seems like a, 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 you know, a, a, a vague dream now, but that was the discourse through the early 2000s. Michael Clare wrote about six books on the, on the topic. Okay. The problem being that these ideas made no sense. As critics in the early 20th century first argued, sad to say, with little effect. So one of the things I discovered in researching this book is that it is the left, that is, 
progressive academics in the 1920s who first exposed the factitious nature of these beliefs. But oil crafts debunkers today, almost a century later, are found primarily on the right, not the left, in the Cato Institute, most prominently, rather than the Open Society Foundation, the Institute for Policy Studies, and the Nation Institute. Today's Anglo-American left appears wholly under its spell. So I'm going to take one illustration from the book to show how this constant dumping of factitious evidence for the imagined things, for the imagined things, happens in real time, something like real time. You see, one of today's doctrinal verities is less than 20 years old. This is the idea that the United States has a special relationship with Saudi Arabia, understood most basically as a pact or an agreement, or an alliance, or in the belittling words of the New York Times columnist, columnist Tom Friedman, a deal. We have a deal. Oil for security. The deal is said to go all the way back. Oh, man, I had a good picture of this. Let's put it up for a second. So here's the deal. I have, a, I have only a very backward version of uh, PowerPoint, so I couldn't really embed the video I want to show you. But let's look at this picture. So. Yeah. So maybe some of you know this picture, okay? This is this picture is said to is to illustrate when the deal was consummated in February 1945 at a meeting aboard a US destroyer, the SS Quincy. This photo, this photo is now ubiquitous in books, articles, and websites, but only after 9-11 was it ubiquitous in websites and so forth. We'll talk about it. Before then, there was only one place you could reliably see this photo, and that was in the Saudi embassy, because they loved this photo. Okay. Okay, so now, so let's see, let's, let's, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Who are the actors in that photo? Uh, uh, king Abdulaziz ibn Saud, the first king of Saudi Arabia, a guy named uh, uh, from another tribe or another chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and between Roosevelt and uh, uh, Abdulaziz was a man named Bill Eddy, who was the translator for the two. And Bill Eddy was a, 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 what are those guys called? Missionary son, grew up in Beirut, grew up speaking Arabic, etc., became a U.S. ambassador, then started working for Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil company. Okay, so uh, we're just going to watch five minutes of a video. This is a, this is a, a sum, this is a panel. 2016 summit on Saudi Arabia, March 5th, 6th, uh, 2000, I said Our 2016. Our speaker and moderator, and she is so incredibly confident that she can both moderate and speak and probably do many other things at the same time. And I'm talking about somebody that I admire so profoundly, and that is Phyllis Bendis. I'm, I'm on this panel too, and you'll see my bewilderment know, during this. Phyllis directs the New Internationalism Project at IPS. She's a writer, activist, and analyst, and also a fellow at the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. She is a very prolific writer, and we have this incredible primer on ISIS that Phyllis put out in record time called Understanding ISIS and the New Global War on Terror. We recommend highly that you buy it here at the Code Pink table. And maybe we can even snag Phyllis to sign some books. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I want to speak just one second, not as uh, Code Pink, but as Medea Benjamin. And that is that um, I am excited just by the momentum that Bernie Sanders has gathered. Uh, except that some of us are a little disappointed on the foreign policy front. So when I start dreaming of what the foreign policy would be like for the 99 to present, it could be with Bernie Sanders in office, but only if he had Phyllis Bennis as Secretary of State. My first words, Medea, God forbid. I did just write what a Bernie Sanders doctrine might look like, called No Wars for the Billionaire Class. It's in the nation, thank you, Roan, um, but God forbid. You know, this is an amazing moment for us 
who have been working for a long time on the wars that are ravaging the Middle East and beyond, uh, to be focusing very sharply on Saudi Arabia, a country that is very much responsible, a government that is very much responsible for much of the terrible things that are going on. You know, for years when I was talking about sanctions in Iraq and the devastation wrought by sanctions, one of the, the sort of quotes that we used to use came from Tacitus, from the old Roman writer, you know, who said the Romans brought devastation, but they called it peace. This is very much what the United States is doing now, and it's very much what Saudi Arabia is doing now. Certainly they are in Yemen. Uh, but the US, because we're going to be talking in this panel about the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the US around oil, around arms sales, etc. And I think what's important is for us to keep in mind all the time as we think about the particularities of the moment to remember <coughs> that the US has been at war with terrorism, as they like to put it, for almost 15 years. And terrorism is doing just fine. Terrorism is doing just fine. It's people and cities and nations that are being destroyed by these wars, not terrorism. And the terrorism can rely on Saudi funding and Saudi fueling of the, of the antagonisms and the inspiration. There's a whole lot of things that terrorism can look to Saudi Arabia for. So if we're serious about fighting terrorism, and I think we should be, it's an issue for, for not as much for us, but for many people around the world, it's a serious issue. We need to look very carefully at what we are doing in the partnership that our government maintains with this absolute monarchy in Riyadh. Now I'm gonna speak briefly now and then introduce our other brilliant speakers. Um, and I thought what I would do first is sort of lay out a bit of a timeline of US-Saudi relations. Sort of what does it look like and when did it start and why? Just to kind of get us all on the same page, if you will. So 1932, it goes back much earlier, obviously, but I'm going to jump ahead a lot. 1932, Saudi Arabia becomes an independent state. This is in the period after World War I, after the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, already, U.S. oil companies were involved in explorations of oil in Saudi Arabia. But only one year after independence, in 1933, the first official oil concession from the new state is given to Standard Oil of California in the creation of Aramco, what was called Saudi Aramco. It was made up of a consortium of four U.S.-based oil companies. Then a few years later, 1945, after World War II, you have the famous meeting between FDR and then King Saud. They meet on a, on a warship near the Suez Canal where the, the great pledge is made that amounts, it's, it's technical how they word it, but the essence of it is a quid pro quo. We'll guarantee access to oil, although it wasn't only about access, it was more about control. And you will provide protection, whether that means arms or sending troops, nuclear weapons, nobody really knew at the moment what it was gonna look like, but we will keep you under some kind of a military umbrella. You will give us all the oil that we need. Okay. So that's Phyllis's version of the beginning of the deal. Let me just get my power point back up. Medea Benjamin, the founder of Code Pink, went on to write and tour behind her own book, Kingdom of the Unjust, behind the U.S.-Saudi connection. And she liked to tell the same story of the famous meeting in 1945 where, and I'm quoting her from a mosque where she presented this in Fresno, California, basically FDR said, not in these exact words, you the king can go about doing what you want inside your own country. We're not going to get involved and tell you how to rule internally, but we're going to make sure you don't get overthrown as long as you keep allowing Western oil companies to come in here and make a lot of money and to export cheap Saudi oil, we're going to guarantee your security. Okay. How do they know what was said? Although, quote, it is technical how you word it and not in these exact words. It's tricky since all extent records of the meeting say nothing about oil, security, packs, alliances, weapons, and so forth, quite the opposite. I've read the declassified State Department records multiple times. 
I've read the book published by the guy who served as translator, and I've even read Ibn Saud's own records of the meeting. Until 9-11, in 1945, some of you will know this or remember it, you're old enough to remember this story because it fits into a very different narrative. Until 9-11, the 1945 meeting had served to anchor arguments about the evolution of U.S. policy toward Palestine. My picture up here, I don't know why it's not there. Sorry about that, it's just disappeared on me. So there's supposed to be a newspaper clipping there, and I don't know why it disappeared, but you know, U.S. recognizes Palestine, etc. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the meeting has always been discussed in terms of U.S. US, the U.S. position on Palestine, which was Roosevelt's main concern for visiting the king. He was there to discuss the Palestine question, and that's what we have in the transcripts. From other records, we also know that far from promising to protect the kingdom, Roosevelt and his successor refused Ibn Saud's repeated requests for a treaty of alliance. As for arming the Saudis, as they both just claimed, the king sought in vain over the next few years to purchase weapons and planes, and was turned down over and over again. The Truman administration famously ignored the promise of Palestine, made by FDR. FDR promised Ibn Saud in this famous meeting that, look, we will not make any move on Palestine without consulting with you and the other Arabs first. And Ibn Saud, you know, tried to hold Truman, <coughs> Roosevelt, and then after Roosevelt died, Truman's feet to the fire saying, hey, you remember that promise? And Truman, of course, just abandoned it. Didn't matter, it didn't matter at all, right? And that, that's the narrative we know, right? Um, and how, why was Truman able to abandon it? Because as Nadav Safran, who wrote the most important book in the 1980s about Saudi Arabia's security dilemmas, underscored, the king's relationship with the U.S. was then basically that of a client. Or as I put it in um, uh, America's Kingdom, yeah, there's my photo, Truman. Here's my guy, Truman. Uh, um, as I put it in America's Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, was not that different from Panama and El Salvador in the same era. And like these two latter American dependencies, lacked the capacity or will of other nearby states to challenge the prevailing order. The client, Ibn Saud, would be rewarded for his acquiescence to US recognition of Israel in 1949, sorry, in 1948, he would gain token economic aid in 1948 as a, re as a result of his reasoned position on Palestine. And then the US provided some military training beginning in 1949, similar, actually identical, to what they were doing for the king of Egypt and the Shah of Iran at the same time. Right, so here the United States is backing the three, most the, the three autocrats of the region at a key time. They don't have to do it for oil or anything like that because there was no discussion of oil. And despite this, despite Phyllis's, Venice's belief that we armed and protected the Saudis, we did no such thing. Okay? So let me state the point, basic point, as plainly as possible. No study of U.S.-Saudi relations for the next 50 years, from 1945 through the next 50 years, no study said any such thing about an agreement back in 1945 to trade oil for security. And most didn't bother to mention Roosevelt's meeting. It's kind of unimportant in the scheme of things. That's for a good reason. The idea that some trade of oil for security took place that day is a myth. Zero documentary documentary evidence exists to support it. So, now this is another discovery from the research for the book. The argument that an explicit trade of oil for security underlies the relationship with the Al Saud, and if you're an academic, 
if you're a graduate student, if you're teaching the Gulf, if you're thinking about this world, you've repeated this story yourself. The basic form of relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia is some kind of agreement we trade oil for security. We all say it. We all know this photo. Okay? Well, the first time that argument appears in print is in February 2002. That is a few months after 9-11. But that account, the first account of this so-called deal, oil for security, doesn't look back to 1945. It's talking about the start of the close ties between the United States and Saudi Arabia in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, not 1945, in the wake of the Arab oil embargo and the massive fortune amassed, amassed by the Al Saud following the price shock of that time. I mean, I was a freshman. Uh, going to Stony Brook in September 1973, so we, re we hazily remember that oil crisis of those years, or at least some of us do. A few of us in this room do, okay? But that's where at least the first story about a deal, oil for security, locates the beginning of the deal in the, 19 in the 1970s, okay? But the Saudis, the public relations firms, and their many friends in Washington, New York, Houston, and Los Angeles would milk this meeting with FDR for all it was worth after 2001 in order to diffuse the outrage over the 9-11 attacks. You might remember that moment, too, after 9-11, when the Saudis go into overdrive and the Saudis' friends in the United States go into overdrive to try to pr protect the relationship from the mounting criticism of it, right? Um, um, and guess what? It worked. Phyllis Bennis and Medea Benjamin are proof. But we have just scratched the surface. Here's what you find now as enshrined truths. Cable News Network's website under the heading Saudi Arabia Fast Facts notes that since the end of World War II, Saudi Arabia and the United States have maintained a relationship based on an exchange of oil for security. Retired CIA agent and Brookings Institution uh, so-called expert Bruce Rydell writes that FDR had arrived in the Suez Canal to conclude a bargain that would trade American security guarantees for access to oil. The PBS documentary arm, Frontline, insists that at the meeting, quote, the two leaders cemented a secret oil for security agreement and, and, and vowed to defend the monarchy against all foes internal or external. Now, I would invite you to you know, figure out the conundrum here. If it's secret, how does Frontline know? And if they're pretending that it's declassified, no such thing exists. They just write it. Michael Clare, sorry, that's the front line uh, 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 item on his timeline. Michael Clare calls FDR's decision in 1945 to arm the Saudis faithful. Again, there were no arms to the Saudis in 1945. Marx's geographer, Matt Huber, says the deal was about securing oil not for American consumers, but rather for U.S. oil capital. One can even download a ready-written essay on the topic in case you, presumably a secondary school student, need one. The relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia can usually be summarized by the term oil for security. The theory behind it is that the United States needs oil and can get it from Saudi Arabia, who in return has it for security. The truth is, there is no deal. However many times the idea gets repeated on the op-ed pages and the code of pink rallies. And as far as the oil goes in the factitious oil for security deal, back then, nothing had to be arranged, negotiated, traded, or secured. The king had awarded a 75-year concession in the 1930s that gave U.S. firms control of production and marketing of Saudi crude oil in return for tax and royalty payments. It was a contract. In that arrangement, the oil, let me put this way, the oil was already flowing when FDR met Ibn Saud. There was nothing he had to do. And the firm was busy expanding its production capacity. 
Ibn Saud was, as I documented great length in my book, desperate for revenue. That was what the deal was. The company pumps oil and pays Saud for it, Ibn Saud for it. And that was an arrangement that remained intact until 1972. Okay. So much has changed in the decades since, although you wouldn't know this from those who still see the Western oil companies behind the policies of the US state, or the US state in control of the oil resources of the Persian Gulf. The price shock of 1973 and the takeover of the foreign oil company's assets were catalysts for upheaval in the industry in part foreseen at the time. The obvious example is the development of new non-OPEC areas of production such as the North Sea, which began to be discussed almost immediately um, and became a reality just a few years later. Other changes emerged out of the disorder of the end of the Aramco and other concessions inside and outside the Middle East. There are no more concessions. Oil companies do not have concessions for oil in the Middle East. They haven't had it for decades, right? The 1970s and 80s, saw increased third-party transactions and a new unprecedented volume of trade on various spot markets. As I already noted, Middle East oil is now sold on the New York Mercantile Exchange and other exchanges elsewhere across the globe. By the early 1980s, the first oil futures markets began operating in New York, Chicago, and London. Hard as it is for some to imagine, it is OPEC that deserves credit for bringing about a proper world market for crude oil. The world of 2010s is, is a far cry from the world of the 1950s. And it's only in the minds of some people that they think nothing has changed. So I could go through the various kind of schools of thought about oil and strategy and try to capture we have a wide audience here. Some of you will believe different things, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to offer you are three axioms that kind of distill for me. Here, these three axioms that I'm going to present go far in falsifying the claims of those analysts that the left has relied on, have relied on for their understanding of oil and strategy. Okay, I don't know where you where you learn oil and strategy from, but uh, uh, there, are, there there are the Michael Clares. There's the David Harveys, if you're a Marxist geographer. There's Noam. And whoever else you have come to rely on, okay? I'm going to present you these three axioms, and I want you to think how they respond to arguments that you believe. And I'll tell you about why some of these arguments matter. I'll give you some illustrations. The first, the first axiom is that in a market filled with buyers and sellers, everyone has access. In a market filled with buyers and sellers, everyone has access. Now, think about how every U.S. president from the 1970s on, 1970s on, have, has presented the basic foreign policy problem of the United States and the Persian Gulf when it comes to oil. We must secure unimpeded access to oil, but we have access to buy the oil on the market. That quote. Okay, in a market filled with buyers and sellers, everyone has access, is a quote, well, I'll tell you about where it comes from, and so I get excited about this. Okay, so <laughs> consider the now hazily remembered days of the so-called energy crisis. Again, some of, a few of us were there. When the U.S. began selling advanced weapons to both the Shah of Iran and the Saudi government, right, the latter among so-called boycotters, yet we're selling arms to the Saudis at the same time that they're allegedly boycotting the United States. And why are we doing that? We're in order to secure regional stability and preserve access, the president said. Now let me say, we could spend an hour just on the things people are, but actually a, I can spend a chapter of a book on the things people have come to believe about the so-called oil crisis of 1973. Most of it is fiction. So the idea that it was the OPEC boycott, and OPEC didn't boycott anyone. Uh, but OPEC uh, 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 was happy to sell as much oil as, as it could. But you go on, you go to New York Times today, look up oil boycott, OPEC boycott. You'll see Dan Jurgen talking about it, others, everybody talking about some OPEC boycott that actually never existed. Okay. 
So most of that stuff is fiction. But it is when the Massachusetts Institute of Technology economist Mo uh, 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 Morris Edelman tried to bring reason back into the discussion. So what Edelman was talking about when he advised, when he when he when he came out in public and said, in a market filled with buyers and sellers, everyone has if filled with buyers, everyone has access. He was saying that no boycott could possibly work. Markets would guarantee buyers access without the need of force. Producers can't target a specific country without shutting down production to all countries. And no state has ever opted to keep all of its oil in the ground rather than sell it for the goods, services, prisons, palaces, weapons, and so on that someone like Saddam Hussein depended on back in the day. So Edelman told folks, the Saudis cannot, whoever was calling a boycott of the United States, he said it would fail. Because you cannot boycott one country unless you boycott all countries. Otherwise, the oil is accessible, and no country is going to stop selling oil. And that's exactly what happened, and the boycott did fail. Okay, you, uh, it, it ended four or five months later with some face saving gesture, but literally, uh, 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 the amounts of imports remain uh, remarkably the same uh, across that time. But we believe there was some crucial crisis to the United States, and we, we well, there was a trauma. We've not, re we've not recovered from the trauma of the 1970s yet, but we just, you know, have some crazy ideas about it. So look, this idea that you can't, that, that countries that can't boycott one, one place without boycotting everyone or else it will fail, well, I've traced these ideas, right? Com countries are going to sell their products. I trace these ideas, these criticisms, back to the 1920s. But again, keep in mind that back then, now I know no one here was alive in the 1920s, correct? But back then, oil had not yet come to be seen as exceptional. Quite the opposite, in fact. All raw materials and natural resources were treated the same way. Well, we can go ahead. Now I can bring up a moment that some of us in the audience might remember. The 1950s and 60s. If you, if you go back and see what the radical critique of the Vietnam War was, right? They, they talked about the needs for the Eisenhower administration is really there for all the raw materials that Southeast Asia can provide, etc. Uh, and that goes on through the 1970s on the left, right? Um, uh, so the radical critiques of the Vietnam War or the conservative think tanks arguing at the time, advocating for the U.S. to quit supporting decolonization. We have this myth, we know the myth, that the United States was firmly behind uh, decolonization in the third world and the creation of the trusteeship system and the, decolon and the uh, 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 creation of independent states in Africa, when it was actually quite the opposite. No one suspected that independence would, take, would, would, would go forward. But the conservatives in the United States at the time, more than others, kept arguing that Eisenhower was too much of a decolonizer and uh, the, the U.S. needed to recognize the vital need of the colonies in supporting the, the uh, needs of civilization. Okay? It is only with the so-called oil crisis, in other words, a kind of, as I said, a psychological trauma in the United States whose impact we are still feeling today that oil takes on the magical status it has today. And all the histories of the earlier decades and about the concerns for all those other strategic commodities get rewritten to reflect this idea that it was only one commodity that anyone ever cared about. And a perfect example of, of this would be Dan, Daniel Jurgen's book, The Prize. Okay. okay, so axiom one, in a market filled with buyers and sellers, everyone has access. Number, second axiom. Another, I, you know, I come from MIT. I got my PhD there, so this is my MIT uh, uh, celebratory talk. Uh, another MIT professor, Barry Posen, the head of the Institute Security Studies Program and a consultant to the Defense Department. Not the kind of guy we usually have in the Kevorkian Center. He's the kind of guy that would be talking in the Wilk Family Department of Politics to the other, the other international relations people. He's a defense, he's a defense intellectual. Uh, an amazing one. Head of the Institute Security Studies Program is following in Edelman's footsteps. That is, 
Posen recently has called for a radical rethinking of its of the of the country's unnecessary, I'm quoting him now, counterproductive, costly, and wasteful globe-spanning strategic posture and military force structure in Europe, Asia, and the Persian Gulf. And he, and he does this in this book, and he includes in that prescription for the United States to follow. He says, any effort now or in the future to preserve the current Saudi government in power is unnecessary. There is no need to secure the continuation of the al Saud in power. This, you know, uh, sends quakes in the minds of people in Washington these days. But this is a defense intellectual. And supposedly, it is that oil in the Persian Gulf that anchors the American supremacy and hegemony. And here's Barry Posen going, you don't have to do a thing. Why not? He includes, right? So, so if you read this book proper, you'll see he works through a set of routinely evoked claims that ostensibly justify the military presence. So some of you think like strategists. Some of you think geopolitically. Others of you think about, I, I don't know, the firms are really behind the US state. I, you know, I don't know where you are on this, right? But for Posen, right, what Posen is sort of saying, after working through all these general claims about why you need a military presence, the vulnerability of transit routes, the threat of a future Saddam Hussein-like figure who would raise price or withhold supply. And this kind of claim is made all the time in testimony to Congress. The United States must remain in a Persian Gulf now because some, well, the racism of the past is still in the present, that some Arab doesn't really understand the way world oil markets work and they're going to control this thing and, and starve the West, right? He concludes, after looking at all these, that the threats and benefits that are usually invoked are not compelling. See, either one, the stories are made up and you shouldn't think about them at all, or there might be some reasonable threats, but guess what? They can't be dealt with efficiently by military power. So the real threats that are there, the US Army, the US military can't solve. Right? Uh, how about this? A revolution in Saudi Arabia. That's what he's thinking. The US military is not going to be able to stop kind of transformation in Saudi Arabia. We might think it, right? But we're not strategists, etc. So there might be some reasonable threats that military strategy can't handle. Or there are then all these made up, there's all this made up stuff that is like kind of irrelevant, but people invoke all the time the famous choke points uh, that, that where the West is going to be starved of its oil and so forth. Now, Here's Posing writing in the 2010s about this. I've been able to trace that kind of objection going back to the end of World War II. Posen, now Posen thinks, okay, Posen is a rationalist, right? So he's like thinking, th thinking theory thoroughly about what it is that the United States claims it's doing in the Gulf and what it can actually do. And he says that since the results of a cost-benefit analysis are both straightforward and inescapable, some other factor X must explain, it's very hard to find an image of factor X, okay? <laughs> some other factor X must explain the enormity of the sums expended when the flow of oil itself has never seriously been at risk in all this decade. And he says, I suspect that global prestige and influence is this factor X. Now, that is close to what some of my comrades mean when they talk about US hegemony. But, Posen adds, even this argument is not self-evidently strong. And we can talk about this in the question and answers. That is, it's impossible to account for that capacity in any kind of tangible way. So the US is there in the Gulf. And it's got this prestige thing going on. And every 10 years or so, as a new article has come out, it decides we have to crush one person or another just to show that we mean business. But it really doesn't have any kind of you know, material impact on us, right? Well, Posen is so saying it's impossible to account for that capacity in any kind of tangible way. What does the United States finally get? If you're looking at oil markets, for instance, are prices lower than refiners would pay absent the United States being there? 
Oh, are, what, what, are there additional quantity ships that wouldn't be shipped if you know if not for the uh, presence of the U.S. in the Persian Gulf? Or are there extra reserves that big oil claims on its books as a result of decades of force projection? It's absolutely nothing like that. There's no tangible return in terms of the, you know in terms of oil market supplies imports that come from this. Now beware of those who claim that the issue is more complicated, but they never specify how it is. Okay? <laughs> if it's global prestige and influence that strategists and activists believe the US Navy delivers, well that reads just like another strategic rationale to me. Uh, well, it, it, this is an IR term, strategic rationale. Let me tell you about, you, you know, what are some of our famous, so IR guys like to do this. There's some rationale that policymakers put forward to the public, but there's like some real thing going on behind it, okay? And we have many strategic rationales in the past that were supposedly, try, that we were supposedly trying to uh, uh, discover what's really going on behind them. Uh, our, um, our favorite one, civilizing mission. We've got a civilizing mission. Or, um, uh, democracy promotion, right? And we go, no, come on, we're not really about democracy. Or our favorite from the Vietnam era, falling dominoes. Okay. Or energy security. <laughs> Oil is different, or so many believe. But is this claim true? Sure. Historians will continue to mine the archives for evidence that behind the rhetoric, oil preoccupied the principles in some event or crisis. I don't know if this is readable, but you know, here's a declassified document, protection and conservation of Middle East oil resources and facilities. So you can read that in the declassified index, right? But the people who discover this document and use it to public, write their next article or book, right? Never question the rationality of the policymakers' beliefs. And, not, and that's because they're not questioning their own. They share those beliefs with the policymakers about this thing, oil, that is so strategic and important to the world. Finally, for many policymakers and analysts, the United States is its, is itself, it itself is a uniquely stabilizing force in the market for the world's most vital commodity. Absent US primacy, supply and therefore price would be that much more volatile. It has to be believed. Posen encapsulates the view of which he is quite skeptical as follows. The guardianship of the United States military since the 1980s has preserved order, guaranteed supply against political shock, and so has underwritten the price that all consumers pay. Although, he adds, he has seen no evidence of that benefit. You understand that you cannot test this negative. We're there, that's why everything's been good. <laughs> okay? This is because there isn't any evidence. To the contrary, all those accounts of oil's unique strategic value driving the politics of intervention, of a potent oil weapon that the Saudi leaders wield alone or as part of OPEC, wittingly or not, on behalf of the U.S. patron, and I've just read yet another left account that says the oil, price of oil is set by the United States in the Gulf today through its influence through Saudi Arabia. That the United States controls Saudi Arabia and sets a, 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 a price of oil. Look them up, Max Agile makes this, makes this claim, okay? Or of the gains that the United States effort on behalf of refiners and consumers. Well, all these ideas founder if we compare the volatility of oil prices with that of all the other more humdrum commodities bought and sold on the world oil market. Let's stop and think for a second. Okay, newspapers every couple of months tells you some. You know, we now have a super OPEC, right? OPEC, Russia, a few other places are all seeking to control the market, raise prices, etc. Right? Um, and for for a, a, an analyst like VJ Prashad, actions by OPEC are always political. They're constantly trying to punish the Russians or other people by doing this stuff. But somehow, in all of this, we just take for granted that OPEC of Saudi Arabia has this remarkable power to control the price of oil. And we see stories about oil prices all the time on the front page of the newspaper. Have you ever seen a story about copper prices on 
the front page of the newspaper? No, that's you got to go Wall Street Journal, like Section Three, you know, for the traders over here, right? To go on, etc. But so, what are what are the prices? What are the prices of all these other commodities doing? As oil prices are going up and down through OPEC, you know, Russia, Putin, and so, and so forth. So this is the first time I've ever seen someone actually compare oil prices to the prices of other commodities on the world market across the 20th century. Turns out technical economists now know all about this. They follow one another perfectly. Economists are even puzzled by this. So there are you know, large papers to try to explain this, like constant you know, co uh, 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 co-variation of, of prices of all commodities. So the third axiom is that prices of all raw materials rise and fall in tandem. We don't tell story about the political actions that are driving the prices of copper up or down, or cotton. We tell it about oil. But it turns out the prices are going up and down in exactly the same form. That suggests one of two things. The price manipulators of the special commodity, the Saudis or OPEC, have this remarkable power to get the prices to go up and down exactly the same as all these other commodities. Or all that action hasn't mattered a bit, at least not in ways that most experts and citizens, consumers and activists, and yes, even many presidents and generals, let alone the professors, imagine. Okay? And the one other thing, I've stole this chart, and the, the, the main thing about it is, this chart is doing something more for the guy who designed it. And what he wants to point out is, it's when those prices are high, not just oil. And remember, this is before, you know, this is going back to where, before oil even mattered as the main energy source, when coal was more important. Mm -hmm. But it's at moments of peak prices that states engage in aggressive action. And thinkers like Michael Clare tell us we're running out of the stuff and we're gonna and the and the West is gonna be, you know, Clare was, we're running out of the stuff, the West is gonna be fighting China and Russia for what's left, so we better just, you know, get off oil uh, immediately, right? He wasn't advocating fighting, he was predicting it was gonna happen. It's always at these times of high prices that people predict we're running out of oil. But it was equally high prices for copper, and no one predicts copper is, you know, quickly running out, and we're and we're going to have to have war, resource wars uh, for what is left, etc. And again, from t from the point of view of 2019, I know I know it's really hard to remember 2002, 2003, when folks were predicting oil wars, more oil wars in the future. Okay. So freeing ourselves from the laws of geopolitics. The, the cycles, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the last cycle, cycle four, it yeah. had to end. Like he took, a, he divided that span of time, in, so it, it's repetitive essentially. Like yeah. And each of these times, he, well, you know, pri how about this? <laughs> Commodity prices are volatile. They go up and down depending on the relative, you know, the, uh, the conditions of the macro economy, uh, what business needs, etc. Right? And if we if we if we carried out this chart further, the prices would collapse again, and we're no longer talking about access, war, resources. But let's wait. Okay, we all now love fracking. You know, all right, sorry, you know, America, I've got there's all this oil. You know, we're fracking oil. I mean, we don't love it. This is the energy and left uh, 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 workshops. So we're going to find out we don't love it at all. But the point is, the papers love it, right? And they have all people have all these whacked out ideas. We're finally going to end it. You know, we're going to have our energy independence. You know, uh, let's just watch. You know what happens the next time. You know if if there's a next time when when oil prices you know uh, uh, rise to the to the uh, heights of what we saw in the early 2000s, and then we're going to hear these stories all over again about the need to secure what's left, etc. But we're not getting much of that now, right? Okay, freeing ourselves from the laws of geopolitics and the spell of oil craft entails costs. The truths of neo-mercantilism and neo-Marxism may seem compelling to many, or at least easier to grasp, naturally even, in comparison to the operation of oil markets. Utter that latter term, I just said it, oil markets, and a critical theorist will dismiss it with some judgment about the neoliberal fiction of free markets, a modifier you did not 
hear me utter, needless to say. Okay? The value, of course, being that the critic never actually has to understand how a barrel of oil gets from a producing well in the Persian Gulf to a refinery on the US Gulf Coast. Finally, for many, it means giving up what seems like a winning oppositional stance. Old ideas about scarcity and conflict, and these are old ideas, back to the 19th century, in fact, rooted in 19th century social Darwinism, neo-mercantilism, geographic determinism, and scientific racism, all of which are impossible to disentangle from the imperialism of that era, these ideas have a long half-life. We hear them uttered over and over again today. In their modern guises, they mobilize environmental activists and galvanize uh, opposition to intervention. They win votes. <laughs> yes, war for oil, if otherwise it means higher gas prices. They justify arms sales. They guarantee the weapons makers bottom lines and subsidize the cost that the Pentagon pays for its own purchases. They smooth the way for government transfer of public wealth into private hands. Their world still pays for Gulf oil in dollars. And Saudi petrodollars continue to flow into the US finance and real estate market. So we can all go look at uh, Matilda, the, the uh, uh, mural of Matilda at the plaza later later on tonight. Uh, um, though I don't know if uh, Al Walid has had to give it back because he's been, you know, uh, uh, dragooned by uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, to, you know, give off some of his wealth. Okay. So we have all these effects of this discourse that we're all engaged in. Okay. There are other effects, and we can talk about them. It's just that the ideas themselves aren't true. Okay, that's it. <laughs> you know, when I've reached out to the Koch brothers on this one, but they still don't want to talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> the map on of the oil price uh, uh, correlation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi, so I'm here just to ask a couple of questions. I'm not a fan of long comments after presentations, so it's mainly um, asking for you to elaborate on things, um, to play kind of the devil's advocate a little bit, and then to open the floor to questions from the rest of you. Um, and my first question, um, starting closer to the beginning of the, of the talk, um, is you mentioned the connection. I'm listening. You just keep talking. I need a pen because my brain doesn't work anymore. Oh, I, have, I have one, actually. I got it, got it. OK. Uh, but you mentioned that there are shared origin points between this conception of oil craft um, and ideas of scientific racism and kind of the, the pseudoscientific ideas of the, um, you specifically mentioned the 1920s is a, an important point. Um, and it's, it's jarring to hear because it's not something you ever hear, right? Um, but it's also something you've written about. Um, can you talk more about these common origins? Um, is this kind of a, an idea of social Darwinism or oil being a limited thing that people must fight over or mercantilism or those kind of conceptions? Um, want them together or? Uh, yeah, go ahead. And then I'm going to ignore them all. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to. Uh, uh, my second is about how we think about the US Saudi relationship. Um, if we, uh, if we do try and kind of de-exceptionalize oil, which is a project I'm sympathetic with, but um, to play devil's advocate, um, this is a very long kind of security connection, right? Um, there's the, uh, the connection between Aramco and the CIA in the early years, which, um, uh, which you've written about. Um, there's the idea of Saudi as a, a swing producer, right, being a, a popular term. Um, uh, so I guess my, my question is, why don't DC people do what Gary Posen suggests, right? Like, so you, you talked about the, the benefits for oil companies mm -hmm. and others, right? So the, clearly there is a reason why this narrative is propagated for particular people for particular reasons. And it's simple that, simply that everyone has fallen hook, line, and sinker for this conception of oil craft and this idea of oil. Um, or is this also something that particular people benefit from, or is it a mixture of all of these things? How do you frame the, the, the sources and origins of, um, of these conceptions? Um, 
And then finally, um, I have a couple other questions, but I'll save them in case nobody else is, in case people are quiet, but uh, the connection between oil and money. Um, so uh, there are all the, uh, <laughs> one of the kind of pillars of oil exceptionalism, right, is this is the connection between um, the, how oil was bought and sold in dollars, which is, you know, a significant, like, um, it's a gift. It's a, yeah, it's a massive gift. Maybe not um, me, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, I mean, it, it relates to, uh, people don't talk about this as much, but the idea of sterling oil in the 1950s, mm -hmm. propping up the sterling zones, the British Empire is kind of clinging on by its fingernails. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, get, if we're going to kind of re-examine um, uh, this uh, conception of oil, uh, what do we say about kind of balance of trade arguments or um, dollar oil arguments? Um, is it simply that oil is the largest traded commodity and therefore it makes dollars useful? Is this like one of the core benefits of this U.S.-Saudi relationship? How do we think about that? Um, and uh, with that, I think you can take your own questions. So uh, I'll let you answer them and then open the floor to questions. Thanks. So it's it's seven ten, and I spoke for a long time and I showed you many pictures. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask let let people field some questions so you you know it, it is your Saturday night and I know you're going into the same <laughs> bar later, but um, uh, please. No. Um, I just want to say something that's said too much of these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just want to say, first, I really liked your talk. I learned a lot. Um, as somebody who isn't practicing historian or working on our projects, but teaching high school students every day, it's fascinating. It's one really heartening to see you take this myth that we tell ourselves all the time in history books. Like, I feel like I use a really good textbook, but it's garbage it, because it includes this idea. And I have a student writing a research paper who's writing on the oil crisis. I'm like, oh, God, i got to grade that. And now I just listen to this talk. So it's really heartening to see you take something that we all consider as part of our pantheon of like what we tell ourselves about, as, what we say about ourselves as Americans that helps us feel good. Um, and that to me is really useful historical work. So I want to thank you for that. And maybe I can answer his second question for you. I think that- That's great. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. But I think that we tell ourselves that this story, that oil is exceptional because it hides a harder truth to deal with. That, and that's that idea that we, racism still, racism and social Darwinism and these ideas that people are different are harder to deal with than we have led ourselves to believe, right? And I deal, I teach in a very specific kind of school where my kids are very, a unique community and they don't think about racism at all. And it's really hard for me as someone who cares about social issues to teach them that. And I see that exemplified in your talk tonight, right? It's easier to think that oil is a special gift and it helps to create this idea of American exceptional, that America is exceptional, because it's harder to deal with these larger, um, more obtuse and more subtle forces that shape how we see the world. Uh, um, when I talk to my students, I'll just say this one thing. If you have students, ask them why we're in the Gulf. They will tell you, because we get our oil from there. That is, that is the default assumption. And when you tell them, when you show them the figures, well, you, you, we can do two things. We can show them the figures and go, actually, we don't do very much oil from the Gulf. We never have, right? There were more and more than it is today, but it was never tremendous. Most oil, imported oil to the United States has come historically and remains the Western Hemisphere. Mexico, you remember that place, Venezuela and Canada. Right, you know, our neck and neck with Saudi Arabia and, and so forth. So you tell students, no, we don't get oil from the Gulf. We don't get very much of it. And the argument goes, then why are we there? They're completely puzzled by it because they assume this like kind of, you know, we're there for us, something like that, right? And so, you know, you could ask yourselves this. I mean, ask yourselves the same questions, you know, why are we there? What are we doing? And, and, and so forth. Um, and then the second side of that is people believe that, you know, during fracking, I had colleagues at Penn. I wasn't at the talk myself, but two of them were giving a talk on Syria. You remember there was a crisis in Syria a few years back with this thing called ISIS. We're over that now. But when ISIS was like doing its thing and the Saudis, you know, people don't like Saudi Arabia very much in the United States. And some student asked the question, well, what about the Saudis funding of the uh, jihadist groups in Syria? Why are we letting them do that? Both my colleagues said, the green side, well, one, one of them said this, the green side of me rebels at this, but 
I love fracking because we will not be beholden to the Saudis anymore for their oil. And I'm thinking, well, how, well when, when will we be holding their oil? But also, guess what? Here's this other kind of crazy idea we have. Like, we think about oil as flowing from co one country to another country. Or the people who are buying that oil, the refiners, are themselves citizens of that country. Right? This is the kind of argument that my critics in the 1920s took apart so tremendously. So Saudi Arabia continues to sell oil to the United States. We continue to have imports from Saudi Arabia. Do you know the main reason for that? Because the largest refineries in the United States are owned by Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Aramco is importing, you know, Saudi crude oil to refine in the United States. It's a total marketing. You know, I mean, it's just like a market process. But my colleague thinks it's somehow wheels and deals between presidents, etc., that, you know, will determine whether there's imports or no imports or less imports, etc. So that's what I said about people not really working hard to understand how actually the oil market works, etc. So, please. But that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if we're importing oil, I mean, we would want to import from countries that are close to us, not far away countries, but their, their availability affects the total world price because if Europe wasn't getting their oil from Saudi Arabia, they would have to get it from Venezuela. They would raise our prices. You know, basically, the transport costs, the transport costs are, are less and less a factor of production these days, right? They're, they still matter, but they don't matter as much as we think. But the reality is, again, most of our imports have come historically from the Western Hemisphere, just as you, just as you, uh, I'm discussed. you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, but your bigger point is, I, I didn't use this as one of the axioms, but here's how you basically, the, the thing you can w walk away with, this is how economists mostly talk about oil now, it's one big bathtub. Right? You don't, it doesn't matter who's producing the oil, where is it, where is it coming from, have a nationality to it attached. It's, an oil, it's, it's for all intents and purposes one large world oil market. And it's, and it's distributed that way. So if there's reductions in one place, there's uh, 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 increases in another, and we're all doing pretty much the same with prices going up, up and down, something like that. But it's, there's no, there are no threats of like some country cutting us off or cutting anybody off and creating havoc. In that, you know, you hear testimony to this effect right now in the Congress. What happens if a Saddam Hussein-like figure comes, or we're get, I'm gonna get to uh, Alex's question in a second. What happens if the Saudis are taken over, are destroyed. The Sa you know, I, my book ends with a vision of post-Saudi Arabia, okay? And we'll, we'll call it the, you know, and the Islamic Republic of Arabia, you know, emerges, et cetera, right? Um, um, uh, and my, all the guys in Washington are totally stressed about this. What is going to happen if the Islamic Republic of Arabia, you know, takes over? What is going to happen? They're going to produce oil and sell it on the world market. Unless, as it transits from ally to enemy, of the United States, because now it's the Islamic Republic of Arabia, we start trying to prevent them from exporting their oil, as we've done, for instance, in Venezuela. So we, you know, ostensibly a country dedicated to guaranteeing access, securing access for consumers of oil, spends a lot of time stopping oil from being produced in the world market, whether it was Iraq during sanctions, Venezuela now, but think about this. You know, Venezuela is producing hardly any oil at this moment, right? Is the world in crisis? So these scenarios, that these the constant scary scenarios, if the if the Al Saud are lost, the world will go into a tailspin. It's ex that 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 scary scenario is precisely what's happening today. The large, you know, the, the complete decline of a major oil exporter in the world. And there's, we're hardly thinking about it. It's hardly mattered to oil markets. I'm sorry, I want to build exactly on what you're saying, but I'm wondering how much this culture or idea of the pervasiveness, pervasiveness of a crisis on oil is an idea that's held in the past, and it doesn't actually apply to how contemporary oil companies work, because a large part of the oil we use now is sin fuels. Mm -hmm. And sin fuels are fracking, they're um, tar sands, 
some small portion is coal hydrogenation, but those ideas haven't changed how people think about oil, and it certainly hasn't changed how politicians and policymakers think about oil. They still think about it as petrol petroleum geologists going around the world looking at big domes mm -hmm. of oil, right? And they're concerned about geopolitics, where they think these big domes are. Okay. One thing I wanted to comment on your question, and I have a question for you, but uh, the, as far as fracking goes, the, especially the Bakken or even the Eagleford Shale and the Permian uh, Basin, it's effectively light, sweet, crude. And what happened in the 1990s and the early 2000s is all of the American-based refiners started retooling to mm -hmm. basically refine heavy crude because there was this idea of peak oil. So they don't really want that light, sweet, crude. So most of it actually gets shipped overseas. Right. It gets shipped to other places. Some of it gets refined in the United States. But I, when I was drilling in the Bakken or helping drill oil in the Bakken, um, we had like the companies that I worked for had contracts with like British uh, you know, refineries. Mm -hmm. So all this oil was being drilled in North Dakota, but it was all going to go overseas, right? And that's because it was light, sweet, crude, and all of the people, you know, these companies had spent all this capital to retool to uh, basically refine heavy crude oil, which is, comes from like the tar sands in Canada or from places like Venezuela. And so that's one issue there, right? Why fracking doesn't necessarily change the energy game in the United States per se. So my question to you though, it, um, you know, the US is always touted as the you know, largest consumer of oil, and in particular, uh, the US military, right, is the single largest mm -hmm. consumer of oil. Mm -hmm. And then simultaneously, the US is also the largest manufacturer and distributor of arms in the world, right? And most of those arms, when you're talking about tanks or jet fighters, they all run on some kind of petroleum uh, product. And so it would stand to reason that there's a sort of like something going on there in terms of like how uh, the US might see it necessary to protect its market, right, for arms and simultaneously need to, I don't know, uh, bolster the market. It's, it's that other part, right? You're, then you have to, I, I got to protect the market for arms, though, you know, actually the arms industry, believe it or not, is a declining business relative to, you know, the services industry and whatever's driving the economy. But that said, yes, we like these people buying our arms. And Saudi Arabia is the single largest purchaser of arms, right? So you might want to protect the Al Saud for that because you're not going to be, you're not going to get to be selling those weapons to the Islamic Republic of of Arabia, right? It's you know you will lose that market. The only thing is, um, there's nothing. I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. There's nothing in particular that the military or anyone else has to do to secure the flow of that oil. So do you know how the military gets its oil? Procurement contracts on the world market. Right, it's not like the United, you know, America, the the U.S. military cuts a deal with Saudi Arabia to give them X numbers of barrels. It, 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 you know, we're a market-based society these days, right? We're privatizing everyone. The the procurement offices just buy contracts like any other major purchaser and refiner of these things. Alex is telling me I got two more minutes. So who wants, please? There's an old adage that says, "Use other people oil before you use yours." And I think if you apply that principle, uh, now we, we are realizing that this alternative source of energy, and maybe it, it doesn't apply anymore, and that's why the United States is, you know, uh, being super productive. How, what do you think of that? Well, that adage sometimes, you know, an economist would always argue, use the, che use the cheapest source of the, of the product. It's nuts. Remember the United States, even though back, remember we said we had this oil for security deal with Saudi Arabia where we, where we protect the Saudis, we don't, you know, or didn't, and they sell us oil. Well, the United States banned import of Saudi, Saudi oil for decades. We didn't get any oil from Saudi Arabia. That's because special interests argued against by using the cheapest sources of oil possible to protect the domestic refining industry, right, for decades. And then the, and then producers were not allowed to export their oil, right, until basically the past four years. Well, that was a gift to U.S. refineries, because that means if you can't sell it anywhere else, you're, you're, basically, you're, you're basically subsidizing, you know, one set of interests or, or another set of interests. 
Um, Alan, yes, last question, okay. Uh, this is actually just kind of a rephrasing of uh, a question. I mean, uh, um, so what, you know, you assume, I think you've spoken to these DC guys who are losing their hands over whether... Wait, hold on a second, hold on a second. I also <laughs> listen to my headphones too, uh, too loud. Look, say it again. So you've spoken to these DC guys who are freaking out about, you know, what's going to happen. <laughs> well, I think that, well, there's two kinds, there's two kinds of things going on, right? I mean, I, I think people believe this stuff about, you know, all other things being equal, we still need the Saudis to get oil and, and so forth. But I think, I think the real, the bigger fear is, again, I use the model I just gave you. What happens if Saudi Arabia becomes Iran? Right? We, the Americans get scared. They think the oil is going to be cut off. That's the one thing that is not going to happen. But think of all the things that will not happen. Right? Think about the United States relationship with Venezuela under Maduro and the United States relationship with Iraq you know, under Saddam in the 90s, etc. And now the Islamic Republic of Arabia. They will be against U.S. preferences. Right? You can, you can imagine this Islamic Republic that becomes this uh, 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 a source of trying to stop or reduce U.S. involvement in the Middle East, right? You know, imagine if Bin Laden's running Saudi Arabia, okay? Um, um, yeah, well, that drives many people in Washington crazy. That means the end of contracts, the end of arms sales, the end of, you know, the, you, you think the Islamic Republic of Arabia is going to be investing their monies in, in Los Angeles anymore or Washington. It's the ends of the consulting firms, etc. It's a whole different arrangement. And now we have an enemy with rents, with oil rents. The oil will flow, but those rents are going to be used against U.S. preferences in the same way that Maduro government was using those rents against U.S. preferences. When the oil, as we all know, was flowing just fine. Right? Alex says we have to go, but how about this? I will sit outside the door and you can, um, you can ask me your question then, and I'll answer yeah. your question later. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. And you can email me, I'm easy to find. We were here two years ago.